Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. Our guest today is Adam Patacord. Adam, are you ready to be great today? You bet. Adam, thanks for being here today. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Jason. Adam is a founder and chief strategist at Customer Success by Design, a customer success solution organization that specializes in helping businesses grow their customer retention, loyalty, and satisfaction. He is also a host of Customer Success by Design Live, a stream series which aims to tell the tales, tips, and tricks of a customer success driven life. Prior to the founding of Customer Success by Design, Adam led customer success organizations for fast growth SaaS companies software as a service companies, such as MediaPro, PayScale, and What Counts, and publicly traded organizations like Oracle and Market Leader. Adam is a U.S. Army veteran who holds a BA in East Asian Studies and political science from Western Washington University, and an MBA with an emphasis on international business from Seattle Pacific. When not guiding organizations to greater growth and customer success, you'll find Adam volunteering as an emergency responder, jamming to KEXP, playing the door with his family and expand his horizons as a suburban chicken farmer. Adam, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks, Jason. So Adam, what's keeping you busy right now? Oh, lots of things. Uh, number one, the live stream. Um, I found it, as I hope you have, is to be just a fun medium just to um, preach the practice of what I do and to help bring guests on and help them get their word out there about what they do and how they can bring value to the marketplace around those things. And um, Frankly, just like I think everyone else out there trying to juggle life now in this COVID world and business, which isn't easy sometimes. So the live, you don't Facebook live, LinkedIn live. How do you do the live? So for me, I stream to um, uh, my website, Facebook, YouTube, uh, Periscope. Let's see. I'm waiting for my LinkedIn approval. LinkedIn, if LinkedIn, hi LinkedIn, if you're waiting, please. Pretty please. I'm a nice guy. I bring a lot of value. My guests bring a lot of value. So does Jason. LinkedIn, that just presses no death. I mean, I'm, I'm getting myself back from there, right? Because I don't understand, right? I'm a big fan <laughs> of LinkedIn. I love it. You know, but then I hate it. But like, you think about any other social media platform, Instagram. And this, this may be you go on Instagram, right? First day, no, no connections, no follows, no, no videos. They give you live right day one, right? Yep. And like on LinkedIn, I know people have like, like, like thousands of followers, thousands of videos, and nothing right yep i just i don't get it i don't get it yeah i'm a little frustrated too i i wonder if they're trying to do the dance between their business model which is you know they have a certain segment that they sell subscriptions to for sales professionals a certain subscription that they sell to marketing professionals and then they have like their their learning subscription and i wonder if they're just trying to keep it gated a little bit because they're trying to figure out like how not to dis disrupt that revenue stream but that's just my you maybe you do something you know like you know linkedin lives free you only do like 10 minutes right you want to pay you do unlimited right I mean, they need to do something else, something else. Yeah, yeah i i i think they're missing an opportunity i don't i don't know also frankly if they're having abandonment issues with you know it's um uh, linkedin as a professional social media network i don't know if what they're trying to create for value is what we're trying to do which is you know, talk proactively about business related situations to people in that community. And I don't, I don't know if what they're getting for most of their paying customers is that, Hey, we just want this to be like our professional Rolodex. Don't give that other stuff to me. So I, I don't know. I, but I share my frustrations. I share the same frustrations you have. I just wish they would be more declarative around what's the secret sauce. I know. Yeah. Out there. And then like LinkedIn is a LinkedIn, a professional, a combination of Facebook, professional, Instagram, you know, trying to figure out, you know, and then, you know, you always tell college students to be on LinkedIn, but hardly any college students are on LinkedIn. So, yep. I don't know. They got to figure something out, I think. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what they decide. I think, I think LinkedIn has the benefit of being the largest professional network. What else, what else do you want to be on, right? Like, right, but I think they have to be careful because I think if they were paying attention to a lot of the communities that are being built, frankly, like you, what you've done, you've built out a community of followers. Um, I'm trying to do that. A lot of people are trying to do that too. I think what these social media organizations need to be careful about is that um, people are pretty smart and are pretty savvy and they're trying to, they're going to try and figure out ways to pull people over to them on um, real estate that they own if they aren't willing to share a little bit more on what they've got. Uh, I completely agree. It's almost like they they know they have a monopoly, right? And, and instead of improving, like I, we have monopoly, we're just, we're just not loyal. 
yep. that's gonna bite in the long run. Tony's gonna come along. Yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, it's a number. Uh, I, I mean, I remember when Facebook came out, and people forget that MySpace was the big thing at at the time Facebook yeah. came out. Facebook does have a chance, you know. Yeah, and and, and um, to your point, someone's going, someone else is going to come along. And I mean, TikTok is in the news all over the place, but the reason it's all over the place is because it's so popular, and it just happens to be owned by a Chinese company, which is frictionous yeah. at best. So, I mean, there, there will be another platform that comes along. There are lots of other professional platforms that are trying to get going. They just don't have the numbers that LinkedIn does now, but one of them will hit and who knows, maybe it's live stream that tips it. I don't know. Yeah. So let's, let's change subject to something more fun. Talk about <laughs> volunteering as a soccer coach. How to get started with that. Uh, that was uh, that was actually a lot of that was a lot of fun and still is a lot of fun. I got started because my uh, son uh, wanted to play soccer and they needed coaches and I just thought, hey, what a what a great thing for a father to do with his son as an activity. So I did it for my son for three years. And funny story is he actually sat me down one day and he said, Dad, I don't want you to get upset, but I don't want to be on your team anymore. We're not any good. <laughs> it's just kind of like, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. It, well, pretty much. So I was like, okay, well, what do I do with this? And so what I did was um, uh, we had a conversation and it actually ended up working out okay. Uh, he went to someone who was much more adept at teaching youngsters the finer things of soccer. But then my daughter came along and she wanted me to be her coach. She actually wanted me to be her coach. So I now, I now coach my daughter's uh, first grade soccer team, which is a ton of fun. So how long have you been doing it? Oh boy. Let's see. Guys, now it's uh, four, four years, five years, four years. Four or five years, yeah. It's a lot of fun, then. It is. I mean, it's just it's. Are you gonna keep on doing it? You want to tell your kids to keep done with it? Um, I don't. Probably not. And the reason is, is you know, I'm. I think I'm good with soccer for like a certain level. I think as soon as you get to that level where, I want my kid to be like highly competitive and special. Okay, I'm good. probably you're, not your you're, guy. You're, you're, you're good at soccer. I'm not the coach. For, probably not. I'm like the. I'll do the cartwheels and have everybody have fun type thing and teach you the basic fundamentals. But like, if you want to get like really good and you want to be that person who's like, I want my kid on the path. That, that's not me. I'm not going to be able to contribute to that. Maybe if it, maybe it was football, I could help out there, but not and, soccer. And, and I think it's a volunteer thing too. You also volunteer as the VP of the, is it American Marketing Association? Of the Sound? Yeah, that's right. AMA Puget Sound. Correct. Is that a volunteer thing too? Yes, it is. And how that come about? Well, so American Marketer Association is an association of marketing professionals that is really trying to help the profession continue to grow and develop and create a sense of community wherever a chapter resides. So, any like new marketers, senior marketers, like marketers in general? Yeah, great question. Anybody who is a marketing professional or wants to get into marketing is more than welcome to join. And so I sit as the vice president of membership. And my job is to make sure that our members know um, what's coming up, the value and the benefits that they're getting from the, uh, the chapter and the association and making sure that the chapter and associations continue to grow and evolve to meet the needs and demands of our chapter members. Is this a national organization or just here in Seattle? So my chapter is a local association of the broader national chapter association. So there's a big, there's a national one and then there's our little hub here in the Puget Sound. How long have you been involved with that? Since uh, January, um, in an official sense, before then, I um, back when I was doing a lot of uh, working for a Martech company, I had uh, much more involvement. And do y'all like recruit like college students to join and do internships or help people find jobs or like do seminars? Great question. It's it's uh, I'm trying to push us to kind of do all the above. I think if you're a, a young college individual who's one trying to learn about marketing and what the landscape is going to be like. As you step out into the professional world, um, our chapter is a great way for you to get exposure to that. Our chapter is also a great way to get exposure to people who are interested in getting writing, uh, writings published, um, getting a chance to volunteer in an organization and stretch their marketing wings, either through social media assignments, uh, writing assignments, whatnot. And then from if you're a leader in the marketplace on the marketing side, this is a great opportunity for you to come in and teach, you know, share your knowledge and frankly, broaden your own brand as being that person who gives back to the community once they've gotten theirs. So Thomas, I think a lot of new business owners, they're going to start a business. I'm going to do marketing. 
I don't think you realize how expensive marketing is, like all the like, content marketing. Oh, yeah. Marketing. You know, you go on and on and on. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I uh, from the sense of a new business, yeah, I think I, I would echo that, you know, um, it's, there's a lot to it because you have to realize that, okay, there's the bucket of, we were just talking about social media, right? So there's the bucket of social media marketing, but each of these tools that you and I listed has its own way that you have to play on their platform. And that's where it becomes nuanced because you have to decide where does your current customer base live? Where do your where do your prospects live and where's the biggest bang for your buck to invest time? And someone who's a Facebook marketing specialist is going to be really different, not necessarily from maybe the strategies, but from the operational perspective versus in Instagram. Actually, yeah, I would say Instagram is a different strategy too, because on Facebook, you have really kind of the, the timeline strategy. They're trying to do a whole bunch of other things, but it's kind of busy. I think on Instagram, it's, it's visual based. You know, it's everything about like that moment in time with that snapshot or with Instagram stories. And then you have to think about the audience that's there. So you and I were talking about LinkedIn, you know, that's, that's professionals, mostly white collar, if you will. Whereas Facebook, Instagram, it's, it's much more broad, much more B2C. So it's like, who are you playing in? And then, and then what's that expertise that you need to command that platform and that tool so you can reach the audience that you want to with the message and the value that you're trying to provide. Yeah, and then each, like, I don't know, Facebook's like an older generation. Each, each one has a different demographic. Don't know. say we're old, Jason. Well, what are you I, doing? I never say I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you're right. You're right. I mean, and you and I were talking, uh, TikTok again is an example. You know, like TikTok is being used by gangbusters for, you know, my niece and nephew who are in their early teens. And, you know, they were into Snapchat, which I don't know now. Snapchat is now kind of reaching the end of its yeah. like, so it's, 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 it's also, how do you keep up with the Joneses as yeah. these new platforms keep and getting, platform has different ways yep. and, and there's no, like, there's no manual for like Snapchat or TikTok. You just gotta, nope. you gotta figure it out on your own, right? Also can teach it to you. Exactly. And then the other thing that you're doing is you're competing against the algorithm. You are competing against the algorithm. You have to, you have to play nice. You have to play by the rules and you have to, un, you have to observe and test the algorithm or you can just pay to play. You know, which, and that maybe that works for your strategy. But I mean, if you, if you are an entrepreneur getting started, I think you need to understand that from a marketing perspective and then give yourself a little bit of grace and just say, okay, I'm just going to pick this one yeah. and just, just, just pick this one, get good at that, lead with that. Hopefully it's one that really resonates well with your customer base. That's where I would recommend you pick, frankly. But then. Um, as your business grows and you can start adding in the pieces to the team who can help you scale out those other components. But I think, I do think otherwise you're just going to try and be everything. Everyone is going to be yeah, I would too much. Recommend, like when you're first out, people will tell you, you know, post a certain time, do this. Like you ain't got time for that. You ain't got time to research. I got to post this post at 9 a.m. and do yep. this and do that. I mean, you just, I mean, just post it right and then you figure it out later. I would say, I, I will. I will say that there's there is a lot of value into finding a um, uh, some a discipline to a discipline like like you were mentioning. Like if if you just find that your jam is you can post every Friday night at ten because that's when the world is quiet to you and that's when you can get it out. Just just be the Friday night at ten p.m. person, you know, and just and just do it consistently. And then once you kind of get to a stage of um, where you can get some additional resources to help then expand it. But I think that's the most important thing is to provide your market with some consistency. Yeah, you can put yourself out there, you know. I know yep. so many entrepreneurs, I don't have to be on social media, I don't have a product. Well, you release your product and no one knows. Like, if, they, I tell people, if someone Googles you and nothing comes up, that's not a good sign. Like, yeah, I, I, I agree. I think you have to, like for me, I had to learn how to get out of my own way. I had like a whole bunch of hangups and like, how I was going to present myself and what was it? And then really at the end of the day, it's just, you know, like just kind of, it's, I'm just going to be me. I'm yeah. too, I'm so tired worrying about it. I'm just going to be me. Here it is. You know, there's a thousand people out there who want to help me make it better. Great. When I get to that point in the stage of the game, exactly. you help me make it better. So Adam, define customer success, customer experience. Are those the same things or different things? Ooh, that's a really good question. So I think the way I like to think about it is, um, 
customer experience is what the consumer, your customer feels with every interaction with you. It's like, what is that emotional reaction um, like for them every time they picked up the phone and call, every time they hit your website, every interaction, what does that look like? Customer success is, are they getting what they want out of that interaction? So it's about, it's so customer experience, I like to frame it as um, the, it's, it's the emotional journey that they have with you throughout every interaction. Customer success is, did I get my goal out of this moment in time with you? Whether that's five years or whether it's this short window of like, hey, I just, I emailed, uh, I'm on your help chat right now and I need this question answered quickly. Okay. Is one of them more important than another one, in your, your opinion? I lean, so another good question. I lean in on customer success and the real reason why is just because customer success is directly tied to what the customer wants. It's their customer, it's the customer ROI of that interaction with you. So CX is really important. It's a big strategy component. Um, when you think about things like um, your, your broadcast here, what do your consumers want? You know, like just from like a, just from you and your brand and everything like that. And how, how can that be consistent? And how are you pivoting to meet that as it changes? But then it's, it's not really tied to anything more than just um, uh, the emotional interaction of that moment. It's not really tied to, and I need to get this out of it. So customer success is I want, I want to walk away with this hand sanitizer that I know will pr protect me from COVID. <laughs> so, so that's, so that's, uh, that's the difference. And that's why. So of course, CEOs and talk everything, right? So that's when you sort of see like being someone else to be like a director of customer success, director of customer, whatever, is it something that starts to bring on? Is it something like, or like after you have 20, 30, or 40, so should someone be dedicated to that? Or that should always be the CEO's thing? Oh, that's a really good question. I, I'm a big believer that you have to have someone accountable to the outcomes of the customer. So how that typically manifests itself um, nowadays, especially in like the SaaS world, is you usually get like a vice president of customer success or a chief customer officer, or sometimes they roll it up under the, the chief revenue officer because it's directly attributed to revenue. But um, if you are that smaller company, you know, it's, it's probably a founder or whoever is responsible for delivering the product. So you have, you, you've got your hustler, you've got your engineer, you've got your marketer, and then someone has to actually deliver the goods. Typically as businesses are starting off, it's that person who's then, who's delivering the goods that is owning it. But then as the business starts to scale, like you're talking about that 30 or 50 employee company, then it becomes, okay, this is actually a revenue strategy for the business. Because what happens is, you know, you've got now this pipeline of revenue that's coming in that's attributed to like these 50 accounts and you want to keep them because it costs so much more money to go get new accounts. You want to keep these ones happy. You want to keep them around forever. So then it becomes not just a delivery strategy, it becomes a retention of strategy tied directly to the revenue. And that revenue is, you're only going to get it if you make the customer successful with your product. I'm assuming this person needs to have some kind of people skills, right? I would think. You, they have, that's a great question. They have to be, <laughs> they have to be a tie. They have to get the emotionality of business. They do, because depending upon what your business does, they are, they are going to be front and center of your, with your customers, period. So even if that is done virtually, like there are a lot of businesses where uh, everything is done online. You know, you, you don't even know if you're talking to a human, which um, by the way out there, like, a new strategy is to please let them know when they're talking to a human. It works really well. Um, and you've got to have that human to human skill set because you are also setting what the benchmark is for your company when they interact with a person. Like, what does that look like? So, yeah, they have to have that. They what, have to have the people skills. Like you go to websites and, and you know, it'll be all these chatbots. So what's your opinion on chatbots for customer service? Uh, the hard brass tax one is it's the future and the future is here to stay because, you know, um, it provides better scale. Yeah. 
It, it really does. Um, and I, for example, Google's been cranking hard on sentiment software that reads the, the chat behavior of um, the customer to see, to make the algorithm be better at providing a response that ties more to the emotionality of how that person's typing with them. So again, it's just, they're making it smarter and smarter. So it's not going to go away. It's, it's only going to get um, broader in its adoption. I think that there's still a market and still a need for the human component and you can differentiate on it. I mean, this is, this is a thing that businesses can use as a strategy, which is I am going to invest in letting you know that if you ever need us, you get a human. You'll, you'll see some people out there on sites that are saying that, talk to me. No, really, it's me. And they'll actually have a picture of themselves on there as they talk to you. Because there are some brands that are going to win off of that. I think there's, and I think that as we continue to be forced to move more digital because of COVID, um, there's going to be some brands that do some really cool and unique things that really sell themselves on, no, you get a person with us. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe there's a cost associated with that, but you know what, your experience, your success rate will be much better than going over here. And the thing I like to think about is just, you know, think about the last great experience you had with your bank online or over the phone. And it's just, it's because they're managing it from an operational efficiencies perspective rather than a delight and drive success for our customers perspective. And every, there's different strategies for every business. Every business isn't at the same stage. I, um, you know, I think at the end of the day, there are certain brands that will be able to get away with saying it's, nope, this is who we are, what we do, blocking, tackling, it's yes, no. So you can do it all digital. Here it is, all support, everything like that. But I think most brands differentiate by attaching to some human component. And I think those that want to win are going to need to invest with a little bit more human touch. So Adam, what are businesses, and, and specifically like small business startups, getting wrong about customer service and taking care of customers? I think they wait too long before they actually establish what great customer service looks like to them. You know, I th it's just little questions like, okay, when someone emails me, what do I expect from my team? How long do I wait? Yeah, there's industry benchmarks out there, but I mean, like, how long should our customers wait? Like, how long, how many rings before someone picks up the phone? How long should they go without ever hearing from us? You know, one of the big negative reactions that happened in the B2C market space with COVID was all of a sudden you had all these brands blasting away all these emails to all these consumers that, they, that. that they've ever had. I'm like, oh, how yeah. they're, yep, how they're now, how they're in the fight. They're here for you. And all you could think about was like, where were you for me this past year? Haven't heard from you forever. You know, did you, what else of value could provide? Oh, now you're going to be my savior here. So I think that's, that was hilarious. it is, it is. And I think, and it happened again with Black Lives Matter. I think they were a little bit more attuned to it uh, this time around. But I think that's, I think that's where businesses maybe fall, need to think through it, especially younger businesses. Just all I like to preach is just, just start by the, literally like just write it down. It's okay if it's, if you have to uh, adopt, uh, pivot it a little bit as you go along, but just start by writing it down and, and just think about the golden rule, right? If you were treated this way as a consumer, what would you do? Would you walk? Would you stick around? Or would you uh, give them another chance? So, you know, it's kind of like the golden rule, do one to yeah, others. I remember two examples, like, I, remember I got email from this one company, you know, not to be another company to send this email out again, I mean, you got a thousand already, then why did you send this email to me? Yep. If you know your thousand and one emails, just like this, why did you send this to me? Like, are you kidding me? Another one that got me too, like all these people were now like, um, what's the word? well now remote, remote this, I'm thinking to myself, you was always remote. Like I know there's one coach, our coach are like remotely, right? So now you're a remote coach. You always been remote. Like, are you kidding me right now? Like, come on now. Like, yeah, I, th I think what you're hitting on is that, uh, your, your customers aren't dumb. You know, they're, they're watching you and you know, it's, it's hard as a business to try and tap into scale and try and to create this unique experience for try and treat everybody like an individual. So it's a bit of a dance. It's, you know, that's a science and an art. 
to it. And you just don't, I think you just have to find your jam, find your voice and be consistent with it. But what it, don't, don't not reach out to your customers, but just make sure you do it with value and, um, and just own it. You know, like if, if it's been 12 months since you've reached out, just say, I realize it's been 12 months. Don't worry. I've got a whole bunch to talk to you about. Here's what's been, here's what we've been up to. That's really good news for you. Yeah. Flap. Or, or some companies, they only reach out to you right before you got to renew. Oh yeah. That's the worst. I, I've heard nothing from you. You know, I've, I've, I've asked you questions in the past. It took like two or three weeks to get back to me. Now it's renewal day. I'm getting emails every day. Or like, well, it's interesting because, you know, so I like to think of myself as uh, being fortunate enough to start my professional career when uh, the internet and e-commerce is really getting like really like blown up in the um, early 2000s. And, you know, the strategy back then was just sticky, 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 you know, and how you got them sticky was like through deep integrations. I think what's happened over time is that the switching cost from that strategy, it's gone, unless it's enterprise, like deep old school enterprise, it's gone way down. So people can hop a lot easier from application to application. As long as they've got their data in order, they can jump from platform to platform pretty quick. Adam, when do you fire a customer? Oh, that's a really good question. I love that one. So the honest answer is if it's becoming detrimental to your business on a couple of components. One, um, your brand. Two, your employees. And three, the customer itself. You know, there, there, there doesn't necessarily need to be this massive ROI return from every customer that you work with, but there should be a good partnership and there should be, um, you know, a, a level of there within the right bucket for what they're paying you for and for how you want to define the great outcomes that you get. But if you've just got this, this constant screamer, who there's really no productive way to see things through, you're kind of left at a fork in the road. You're like, okay, well, Mr. or Mrs. Customer, you can, here, here's the path for you to no longer do business with us. And here's some other places that you can go. We wish you nothing but the best. And that's typically the route that most businesses take, which is just like kind of let it die in the vine. You know, you just have that declarative conversation. You let the the contract run out and everything like that. Um, the instances are very, very few and far between, but there's some times where you just, it's, it's just so bad that you should just make sure that your ducks are in a row from a legal compliant. Yeah. And then, you know, if you need to let it run out, fine, just put them in a sector where they need to just stay. Or um, if there's, if there's an amicable break, amicable break, then you're probably better off just doing that because you're going to spend so much more time possibly dealing with this other stuff, but it's, it's few and far between if that ever happens. So Adam, so a lot of companies do a great job of you know, doing customer service, customer experience, but they treat the owner employees horribly. Can you mm -hmm. talk about the points of treating new customers and employees well? Yeah. I mean, I like to think of it actually, one of the reasons why I love customer success so much is because it provides you this great opportunity to create the universal win. And what I like to think about the universal win is for it's a win for your customer it's a win for your company and a win for the team, the staff that's putting it all together. You know, Nirvana is making sure that those three are always happening in cahoots and growing at the same time. So everybody's like, yay, you know, a big party. Oops, sorry. If I get animated, jazz hands. Um, but I, um, like you, I've been to a lot of organizations where they can't find that. And typically it, it unfortunately is usually the employees who suffer. And I think that a way to combat that is one, you just have to, you have to put in the business a framework where it's, it's about the customer's outcomes and how we drive it. And when we do that, hey, not only does a customer win, but you're going to win. You know why? Because you, Jason, you help that customer make it happen. And that is your track record. That is your legacy. And as you help more customers win, here's the path for you for growth and development as you do that. And you know what other the cool thing is, Jason, as that happens to you, guess who gets the major Rolodex outcomes of that? You. You're the one who's talking to the customers. You're the one who's building that brand of Jason gets stuff done. Jason makes me better. This is, you're building this evangelist network, not just within the company itself, but also out here with the customer base. 
The other teams don't necessarily get to do that because they don't interact with the customer. They don't get to see like, oh, wow, man, like we're doing all these cool things with them. They got to do this. They got this launch and we paid this part. We got this person over here promoted, all this cool stuff. And I think that really it does come down to the leadership level at the business to either put a leader in place who can champion that for those employees and put that in place in partnership with HR or just to build out that culture of just, you know, you've, if you want to win, you know, which is grow your business, you have to make sure your customers are winning. And I just don't know how you can get your customers to win and your company to win by treating your employees like garbage. I mean, it seems to be like that. I know yeah, it's, it's counterintuitive. Like, yeah. You think about if you're getting treated as an employee, what set do you have to treat your customers right, you know? Yeah. You're going to have a bad attitude, you know, down in dumps, and now you got to be like, you know, happy, go lucky, and, you know, be a great customer person. It's, I think it's hard to do. Yeah, and I, I do want to empathize with businesses too, because I think that there's accountability in all. You know, like, I think businesses owe the employees uh, the training, the tools, and the mentorship to, and the clarity around, okay, what does success look like? for the customer and the company and like how to, what are the tools that can help me get there? But the employee needs to take accountability on ownership on, you know, coming to work with the positive can do attitude. You know, if they're, if they are struggling to have the courage to just bring it up in a productive manner with their leadership team and possibly HR and um, you know, just to take, take ownership over the outcomes that they need to take ownership. Oh, over. I, I do think it is that partnership though. And, and, and I don't want to make, it's not like we're, business has what it needs to own. The customers have what they certainly need to own, but the employees also have to own what they have to own as well too. No, I completely agree. So talk about your live that you do. Can we talk about a little bit before we go into more details about it? Yeah. I mean, I just, um, I love talking to interesting people in different parts of the business or who all impact customer success. You know, it's that customer ROI factor. And just because they're a software engineer doesn't mean that what they do every single day doesn't have a huge impact on the success for a customer. So what I like to do is I like to kind of put the dots together for everyone. You know, so engineering's over here, you've got product over here, you've got HR over here, you know, you've got marketing over here, sales, then you've got oh, there's this cool um, uh, new study over here about how you can use human emotions to better tap into getting people feeling like they're positively moving directionally forward so they stay more motivated. There's all these components that go into just keeping the machine going for the customer to get that ROI that they're looking for. And I just think it's a fun way to grab a whole bunch of smart people and just do this. Just, oops, sorry, hit your mic. Sorry, jazz hands again. Uh, just, just have conversations about like what's their subject matter expertise area and then how does that kind of flow into making sure customers get the win that they need with you. It's like daily, once a week, coffee. Do, do, do. Uh, right now I'm doing it twice a week. I think that, uh, so the content is out there on csbydesign.com. Um, I'm going to keep doing it twice a week. And uh, we'll see where it goes from there. And who, who's your typical guest? Is a business person or like, how, who's your typical guest? How do you get your guests? And like, who's your, last question, like who would be your super guest? Like someone like, oh man. Like, you know, Elon Musk, Steve Jobs, you know. Oh, that's a really like, good question. Like, who's your, who would be your super guest? Okay, so a uh, typical guest is, I would, lo I love talking to anyone, frankly, who is in, business because then the, the original question I was, I was, oh, so talk to me about your customers, right? What do you know about them? You know, like how, how do you get them to succeed with you? I think it's because every business, there's a general framework that I believe that works really, really well, but I think every business tackles it differently. So for me, the most interesting component of the conversation is not necessarily what function they live in, but just that kind of question right there. It's like you and I could riff on this for an hour. Or we are, I guess, kind of right now. We could do it again. It's fun. And then, um, so that's the first one. What's your second question, Jason? I'm sorry. Because uh, I know how the. How do you get your guests? How do I get the guests? Uh, I ask, you know. I do this. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, how do you get some great, great guests? Uh, I ask. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's funny. Like, if anybody's out there um, 
considering doing this as a medium, I would encourage you to just give it a try. You'll, I think what I've been surprisingly pleased with was just people, I think people are really interested. I think that they, as long as they understand what they're walking into, I think people just like to talk, especially nowadays, you know, people, and people like to talk about what they know. And um, so, and then to your final question, like um, who would be my uh, ultimate guest? I don't know. How about Oprah? I was talking to a guy today who was jokingly calling. He, he, he was joking with me. Um, he said, you're trying to be the Oprah of customer success. I was like, oh, okay. I'll be the Oprah of customer success. Sure. So why not Oprah? I'll have Oprah on. Cool. Um, so on your website, you actually have your company core values on there. Yes. So I really like a lot of companies. You have no idea what they stand for. So two part question. Talk about your core values. And sure. What was important for you to put it out there for everyone to see. So it was actually harder for me to do than I expected because it's one of those things where you, you start uh, writing everything down about who you want to be and who you actually are and then you're trying to land on it. And then um, so to try and whittle it down took, took some time. So for me, uh, the way I whittled it down was number one, that just uh, we care. You know, I, I, I care about what I do. I care about the customers. I care about my customers. I care about... Uh, the teams, I care about the outcomes, you know, uh, that I deliver, you know, um, the other thing is, you know, we make an impact. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's nice that you care, but you, I'm also a big believer, like, you want to get done, man. Like you, you leave a legacy, you know, and not just any legacy. It's a legacy that matters. And the final thing is that it's built to scale, you know, it, it, it stands the test of time. It doesn't need to stand forever. You know, everything's going to evolve. But what you've built is foundational and always value driven. That will that will help set the tone for in perpetuity, if you will. So, how how long did it take you to do your core values? Oh, that's a good question. Like how many like how, how many cycles do you have to go through? Like you start with twenty of them, and then go lower down to three, or like how that how's that process? I I rewrote them quite a bit. I don't remember the actual timeline. I think when I I'll be very direct. I just kind of got to a point of, you know what, these, these will, there's such a high bar. I think you could put on these that it will never, I felt like it would never be achieved. Like I could never quite get them right. So I had to get to a point to myself mentally where I was like, you know what, these are things I can stand by and feel good about. So I'm just going to put these out there. These, these are, these are good. So I'll be going there. So I think, I think it took me, I don't know. I think I started them on and off. I was floating around doing other things. So let's say 90 days. 90 days, okay. About 90 days, yeah. So who brings in more customers for your business, you or your partner, Luna Bug? <laughs> well, Luna uh, Luna is my dog. Uh, she's awesome. She's like, she's 14. I can't believe that. She's still, she's still kicking it. Um, uh, she, <laughs> she helps. I'm not going to lie. I think... <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm a dog lover. Uh, you know, I like animals and you know, it's, it's part of what makes me me. And, you know, I think yeah, that's, that, on your she, she is, she is, she does a great job. And I think that's one of the things that, um, but people don't the bat, you're a dog lover. Yeah. Well, I think you just have to, like I was saying earlier, you have to find out what's be, be okay being you, you know, figure out what, what's you and, and be okay sharing that. And hopefully that resonates. And yeah, some people think it's just fun and I do too. So we talked about this a little, but go into more detail. I, 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 you're a small business owner. How do you determine customer success? How do you tune the ROI on that? Like, how do you how do you measure that? So good question. Uh, the brass tack streets metrics that you always want to find are you know customer churn or customer retention results. So that's how many customer you started with X number of customers at the end of this time period. How many did you keep revenue wise or unit wise? Uh, so any business out there can do that and run that on its own. I think. But the, um, that's the financial side and the growth of the business. But the other components that flow into that, there's a ton of metrics that drive that. And I think that's where the art and the science come together about every business is going to be a little bit different because depending upon what stage of the game you're in, yeah, a great customer satisfaction score is wonderful. But you know what? You should have a great satisfaction score. You should probably be focusing over here instead on how many customers are actually engaging with your marketing materials in, when they're in the middle of the life cycle with you. Or, you know, okay, 
hey, you got all spun up about your net promoter score, but you know what? You're only serve, you're surveying the wrong people with it. You know, you're, you're surveying people who don't even use the product with it. You just, you blasted it out to your database. So why do you care about that score over something that's over here, which is going back to CSTAT, which is actually surveying the customers who are actually using it and they're telling you something else. So I think that's where it becomes a little bit nuanced as far as everybody who's in customer success should be watching their customer churn or customer retention marks. But then the subset of metrics that kind of go into driving that, I think that's where the ebb and flow is going to be as far as which one's most important for your business at this time or over this period of time. Let me get an opinion on this and we see two things about this. So for the HR side, right? Suppose a company has a job right, a job opening mm -hmm. and we'll say 200 people apply, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, generally speaking, you know, not everyone, but most HR department recruiters, they might, they might reply to five or 200, right? So you have 195 people with a bad experience at that company. I, I just think that's a missed opportunity for, for those companies. Like, you know, you, you know, put add in the email list, do something, right? Cause you just pretty much, you know, annihilated it. Annoyed 195 potential customers, potential business people, right? And I just see it, I just see it as a missed opportunity from the HR side. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think, I think the thing that you don't want to do is not address an issue. You know, if, if someone has had a bad experience, thank them for sharing, you know, and then say you could, if you want to take it offline from, because you're worried about social media blowing up, say, thank you so much. We'd love to just chat with you about it in more in depth. Can we set up some time to do that? And then do it. Yeah. And, then, and then the trick is, you know, like decide as a business if, if the feedback is valid, which you should do. And then if it is valid, take action and then show it. I think, I think people right now are very attuned to organizations that are walking the walk. And so to your point, I think that it's really important that if maybe you made a mistake, did you own it? Okay, great. Did you do the things that you needed to do to correct it? Great. I think that buys you a lot of grace and a lot of um, uh, repeat customers and goodwill and will help you win in the longer term. Then you just, just don't turn the blind eye. Tribes all the time, they, it's, it's ghosting, you know, yep. all the applicants. They, 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 oh, yeah. They don't even give an answer. And then, of course, you know, that person's friend applies, they, they would say, no, don't apply there, you know. I just, yeah, I just think it's a missed opportunity. Well, into what we were talking about earlier, if they're treating their potential employees this way, how are they treating their customers? Very good point. Yeah. yeah it's like, you can't, okay, I wasn't the right fit for a position. Can you close the loop with me, please? Can you provide feedback as to why? Thank you so much. You know, just stuff like that. So for asking the next question, for the people who don't know, can you tell us what a SaaS company is? Uh, sure. SaaS is software as a service. So an example of that would be uh, Salesforce, which is a very, very large CRM company. Uh, Microsoft, you know, is in many ways now a SaaS company, a cloud-based company. Uh, Amazon, another brand that's out there. It's literally the product is software that does something for you. And how can you give some tips though for fast growth for SaaS company? Oh boy. Um, it's going to be highly competitive, highly competitive. So the faster you go and the more courageous you can be with experimentation. So, you know, try, try something, uh, measure it, monitor it. If it works great, if it doesn't, keep the results so you can revisit it at a later time. And um, the more you can find your voice in the marketplace, you know, talk, going back to marketing, how we were talking earlier, I, I think that's super important. Um, SaaS is hyper competitive, but it's a lot of fun. And you just, just, you just have to kind of be game for that, that speed and that hyper competitiveness. And you have to be willing to just, uh, every day, get up and get after it. And most SaaS lends itself to be to VC investment, correct? Because you, you need a lot of money, don't you? Yeah, I mean, yes, because I mean, at the end of the day, what you're selling is software. So software is very expensive to produce. It comes with one of the highest demand um, jobs out there 
from a scarcity perspective, as you well know, which is software engineers, you know, there's just like doctors, there needs to be enough of them. Uh, so, and they're expensive. So you, you need that money to invest in the software itself and the architecture. So you can then go tackle more of the market. But I will say this, there's always hope and there's always outliers out there, people who can do it without taking venture capital or, or private equity or are going down that path, but it's, it's harder. So talk some about the, the SAS like, data, you know, those like churn, sure. tech, LTVs. Like, I, I, I do one time, like, there's literally like, it's in, like hundreds of stats you can use. Like, yeah. like <laughs> yeah. how, do you, how do you pick a choose what's on the track? And it's the such thing as tracking it too early. Like, like you're a pre C startup. What's how can I even how can you even track tech and LTV if you're too early? I would say don't worry about it. Honestly, I would say don't don't spin your wheels about that stuff. Just if you're small and starting out, just start with cash flow. Just start with cash flow. Yeah, I mean it. And that's one. That's frankly one of the values that uh, and benefits a, a good VC or PE partner can bring to your table is they can help you get that type of financial structure in order to help you hit the next growth phase. Now that, that comes with a cost. The cost is, you know, you give up some of the rights to your business and now you're, it's a true partnership, but, and everybody's got to weigh that for themselves, but they're really good at that. And they're really good at that because that's how they make their money. So I think my, my advice to anybody is don't, don't get too spun up about that stuff. It's important. Uh, but I would say, watch, watch your cash flow be on it from a sales and marketing perspective and from a churn perspective. So, you know, um, uh, marketing qualified leads versus sales qualified leads versus leads um, that go into your pipeline versus leads that then convert and close. So now you have sales conversions. Now you're into customer success, which is okay. Time to onboarding. That's initial value. Then, all right, expansion, upspell growth, and then renewal. You know, I, th I would say just, just kind of start there and don't, don't go too much deeper until you have, I mean, that's the value of a good financial team that can come in to really help you get that in order. Like uh, a good, a good CFO can come in and they'll build a good financial uh, structure around that to help. So as a CEO, a founder of a small business startup, you know, you have the marketing, the sales, <laughs> yeah. the this, the that, you know, all this stuff going on. You personally, how do you like? decide to focus on day-to-day -day. do you have a calendar you go by and just like you just wing it like what's what's your plan of attack usually i tried to lay out a marketing calendar for myself and my first strategy was um, i did a lot of blogging so i started doing that and um which was a lot of fun but it wasn't quite generating what i was hoping for and so i had to test a couple of different things and what i found that worked for me was again the, the live stream and so I, I did put together a calendar for myself. Um, I did find a channel and a medium that worked for me that allowed me to give uh, gifts to the marketplace and allow me to put my name out there and, and disrupt the marketplace a little bit. And I stuck with it. I think that's, and then, uh, but early on, it was definitely, you, you could put it all on paper and it looks great and you try it, but then you kind of get to a point where you're like, well, I'll try this. I'll just try this. And you just kind of keep trying things until you, you find what sticks a little bit. So talk about your company in more detail, like how it came about, like your vision for the company. Yeah. So for me, uh, I kind of stumbled into customer success as a profession. You know, I got out of the service. I saw all of my friends were, you know, they had already landed jobs, most at Microsoft, a couple at Amazon or earlier on. And I was just like, okay, so tech is this, tech's just kind of here in Seattle. That's what you do. And, you know, my wife, uh, fiance at the time, we decided to relocate back to Seattle after we both got a service and it was like, okay, well, she'll go do this. I'll go do that. And I just landed in, uh, my first job was on really an onboarding role, get customers set up, trained and drive them to be as successful as you can, as quickly as you can in the short time as you can. And I just kind of grew up through the ranks in that environment in various B2B and B2C SaaS companies. And I kind of got to a point where I was like, man, I, I really know a lot about this stuff. And I think that there's a lot about it can be done better. Um, and there's no reason for people to have to go through the same pain that I or these other organizations have 
And I don't think anybody's really paying attention and coming at it through the lens of that three universal win that I described earlier, you know, customer, company, staff. So my vision for the company was, you know, I wanted to break out and take my knowledge and skill set and help organizations get really dialed in to that early on, help them get it set up, help them get their teams built, help them get um, built for success long-term for their customers, and then go and help the next person with it. And, and is that, are you doing everything organically, I'm, I'm presuming? Uh, yeah, I mean, do you mean just from a growth perspective? Yeah, yeah I'm, not, I'm not buying lists or anything like that. I, no there's no, Facebook ads or like that. No, 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 it's been all organic. And I think, um, I think that works for what I'm trying to do. I think other businesses, it, it may not work, but I think for me, it's been, it's been pretty successful. Are your customers here in Seattle or you got customers across the nation? Uh, I have customers across the nation, yeah. And how do you go like, like getting a customer? Like what's your plan of attack? A uh, little bit, it, it's, it's the dividends that are paying off for me are again, the, uh, how I chose to present myself to the marketplace, to the marketing channels that I've done. You know, the, there's a ton of value that you can provide to the world just by doing things like this. You know, you can showcase um, these interesting people that you know, and you can show, and you can help people really solve tangible problems and give them nuggets that are really just um, appetizers to all that you can provide them and help them really solve. Because a lot of businesses, people are just so heads down, just trying to crank every day. I mean, you know this. Like we're all cranking and just to have someone who can come in and be that uh, advisor, advocate, strategist and help you get it done if you can't do it, you know, everybody needs that wing person. Adam, so do you have like a demographic you target, like certain size companies, certain amount of revenue or is it it's all comers? Great question. Uh, I think that most of mine, most of mine are typically B2B or B2C SaaS companies that are about that series A, series B stage. And I say that because once they get to a certain stage, uh, they're going to go and find someone full time to just do it and run it. And that's what they should do. You know, I just want to kind of come in, help them get it set up, um, help advise or trade or pivot and test somewhere else. But then it's probably time for me to go on my way because you need to now hire someone who's going to refine it and scale it even more for you. So do you charge by the hour, by the project or some other kind of way? It's all over the board. It just really depends. I mean, case by case basis. yeah, it really is. I don't, don't do hourly. I don't believe that's, that's not a good way to understand the value. It's more about this is, this is the outcome that we're shooting for. And uh, so this is the value that I'll provide for it. And so this will be the invoice. So when you bring a company on as a, as a, as a client, how do you convince the CEO that everyone needs to be responsible for customer success? It's not himself or it's everyone. I mean, it's a good question. I would ask them just a couple of core questions. So one, do you believe that you have a customer centric organization? Of course, everyone's going to say yes, right? Yeah. And then I go, okay, prove it. Okay. So how do you prove it? Okay. So two, okay. So then, okay. So you say you have a customer, a customer centric organization. Great. So if we were to walk over to, let's say those people over there and just ask them, could you please describe for us the goal that we have, that all customers have with our products or services, that initial value that they want to achieve? Just, just four random people. Let's just go, let's go tap them. Let's see what they say. And then they get a little bit more nervous. And the final one is, look, are you satisfied with your customer retention or expansion numbers? That's where most CEOs are always going to say no. And the reason why is because it's just a disconnect and it's, it's not a failure of the CEO. It's not, it's just, there's so much going on that they need to be mindful of what, what they don't necessarily realize is that it is an effort to actually build a customer centric culture, just like you want to build a people centric culture, you know, to have a customer centric culture too is an effort. And part of the things that go into that are making sure that everybody can empathize and understand what the customers are trying to get. You have clarity around who owns what as far as delivering it to the customers. And then there's shared outcomes around, okay, you own this little piece of the pie over here and this uh, KPI is directly attributable to this whole journey over here that we're creating for our customers. And I think what gets missed is 
the easiest one, frankly, which is just that shared KPI. I'll, you'd be surprised at how many people don't share that as a, a key part of their bonus or whatever. That is kind of surprising. Yeah. So what, for your company, it's you and your, your business partner, Lumo Bug. Yep. Are you going to be a, a one-person, one-dog show for a while? Are you plan on scaling and bringing more people in? Like, you know, software as a service? Like, what's their plan? Uh, great question. So my vision is there's a couple of problems that I'd like to try and solve on the customer retention, loyalty, and satisfaction space that I don't think are being solved or being solved very well. I'm trying to just to get more feedback as to which one has the greatest market demand for, and that's where I'll be putting together what, um, I don't know what I'll call it, but we'll just call it sassy thingy one, <laughs> and then we'll go from there. But I think for now, it's it's going to be a Luna bug of myself, and I do have um, some uh, partners who can step in and help as the business scales. So I changed the subject again a little bit. You also volunteer as emergency responders. Yeah. Can you talk about that? Yeah, sure. And this is actually something that hopefully um, anybody in their city should check out if you have an interest to. So uh, we live in a city where we're fortunate enough that there is a, um, there's an, a, there's a city emergency response team. And through that, there's a volunteer channel where you can get, uh, you go through some training. Uh, it's all provided for the, the uh, you don't have to pay anything to do it. And you go through the training and then you go into the uh, emergency response database as a certified um, uh, emergency responder. And what that means is in the, in the event of a significant emergency, so let's pick like, uh, I don't know, like Mount Rainier finally blows, you know, you get alerted and you are assigned to kind of be your neighborhood's subject matter expert and kind of triage person because I think what a lot of people don't realize that in big emergencies, government's first job is not immediately to run and come and save the day. Their first job is to assess what's going on. And the fascinating thing that, you know, I learned as I was going through that training is, you know, big emergencies like that, you'll see the first responders and stuff kind of doing, uh, they'll be driving around, but they're not necessarily stopping to help. Well, the reason why they're not stopping to help is because they're trying to see what's going on in those big events. So, you know, events like Katrina or uh, earthquakes or the wildfires down in California, it's, it's, um, they're, they're trying to empower the local citizenry to take command while they're waiting. So it will buy the citizens time in the event of major catastrophes uh, for the rest of the formal um, response team to come in. Now, do they train you to do this or the expertise that you already trained how to do this? They will train you to do that. So it just, uh, for me, you know, I came in with a little bit of the uh, benefit of, you know, having been in the service, I was a combat medic in the service. So I was pretty comfortable with uh, a lot of the, very comfortable with the basic first aid stuff that they taught. But I think for just anybody who's out there, um, the first aid training is really good. Um, so stop the bleeding, airway, um, uh, uh, casualty removal, things of that nature. It's in casualty recovery. So it's, it's all good training. And, you know, it's, it's not a big commitment and it's, it's great. It's empowering. And it's, uh, it's something that you can give back to your community very easily. Have you ever used the skills? Have you, have you actually done the emergency responder thing? Uh, yeah, actually we did it, not in the way that, uh, I imagined, but it's, it still shows how volunteering for entities like this can make a small difference. So my, uh, my city's emergency response team got activated twice as part of the COVID response. And, the first activation was um, to provide uh, essentially shower and cleaning facilities to the homeless population where we live. You know, um, all the shelters had to be shut down, you know, for, for months, you know, and some still aren't open. And so the homeless population was getting hit really hard. So they, the government was able to come up with a program where they were able to provide uh, showers to homeless and, um, they just needed people to kind of staff man and test for COVID and things like that and just do administrative tests. So easy thing to do, uh, nice thing to do. And it, it gave people a lot of dignity and just, uh, you know, the weather around here is really bad <laughs> in, in March, April, May, June, and the first two weeks of July. <laughs> so, um, so that was good. Yes, exactly. 
So that was, a, that was great. Um, and then the other thing that we got activated to do was to help uh, King County deliver food to families in need. So, you know, our city was certainly had its fair share of um, not just homeless challenges, but also families who are really struggling right now, uh, COVID, economy, whatever. And so they have a place, they have means to get people to register, to get food, but then they have to have people who can go deliver it. So actually, and that's something that I take my son out to go help out is go deliver food. So it's, you, you never know what the mission will be. And that's what's interesting because I think the idea of the mission was with the, uh, with the creation of that force was empower the local communities to hang in there in the event of major catastrophe. But I really, uh, really was proud of the thinking was how to, to, how can we tap into this local community of people who are ready, willing, and able to help to kind of help on the peripheries when we were all hit with COVID and just there's all this stuff going on and not to leave anybody behind. And I really respect that. So Adam, talk about your time in the military. Yeah. We, uh, Any stories you have? Oh gosh, uh, how much time do you have? Um, so uh, yeah, so I, um, I kind of did things a little bit backwards. So I went to, so <laughs> I went to undergrad uh, right out of high school to really play football. That's why I wanted to go. And I didn't do so well on the academic side because of that. And I ended up not doing so well on the football side. And so I left, not really, I graduated, but I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And I was like, okay, well, you know what? I'll just go see the world and I'll just go pay off my student loans and I'll go enlist in the military. You know, I come from a long line of people who served. So, and that's something that was always in the back of my mind. So I served and then like literally my second day at my assigned duty station was 9-11. So I was so new that they put me at, as the guard to, because we had to do, um, you had to challenge anybody coming in and out of the building. And, but I was so new that uh, they hadn't even shoot me my weapon yet. So my joke was, I'll just poke you with the stick if you get it wrong or something. They didn't like that joke. I thought it was good. So, uh, so yeah. So uh, after that, um, I was with the 82nd and we got called to Afghanistan in, when was this? Oh, two. So I spent six months in Afghanistan, came back, went through a whole bunch of schools, and then went to Iraq. Let's see, oh, three, oh, four. And I think, I think we worked it out. So where, so I had a four-year enlistment, and in that four years, I was maybe in the United States at Fort Bragg in my barracks, maybe for like a total of four months it's just it was just deploy school deploy school and so yeah so um so how many did you do any jumps oh yeah yeah, yeah. How many uh, did you do? uh 30 a little over 30 i think so i've always heard this is it true like the bigger you are the, the harder it is i mean like the falls and oh god yeah man i've always heard that you want to be an airborne you, the smaller you are the better oh like, yeah the harder you fall like you fall. oh yeah i don't know yeah i think the faster you fall too well the other thing too is like so i had the aid bag so you had, so I had, I had all the combat gear and then you have like your aid bag, which depending upon the mission, you know, sometimes could weigh like 60 pounds. So you're dangling, like, you're dangling like a hundred extra pounds between your legs. <laughs> you're just like, all right, here we go. Uh, so yes. Um, yeah. So for those listening, I'm like, I'm six, four. And I, when I was in the service, I was about two fifteen. Yeah. So not, not a small guy. Uh, no, I, no, no, uh, no. I always like, that's, that's one of the things I learned once I got into the combat zones. I was like, I was just like a giant target. It was like, it's it just like, <laughs> yeah, I am, I am the, pretty much, pretty much. That was, there's a lot of truth to that. So yeah. Can you raise the barbed wire up? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of that. Yeah. So, yeah. So it, uh, that's, that's what I did. I was a combat medic. I served, um, Served in the 82nd Airborne Division. Uh, plenty of jumps, lots of lots of stories. Have you done any skydiving since you got the army, or once you finished jumping the army, you said, "I'll never do it again." I did. I did actually. We did a reunion. Uh, so our uh, our Iraq platoon got together. Boy, maybe it was like five years ago now, in Virginia at our LT's house, and he's pretty involved with the veteran community there. And he hooked us up with. Uh, 
uh, veteran skydive and we all just went out and jumped again. It was, it was great. It was just kind of like, Oh yeah, I remember doing this. Woo-hoo. Yeah. I think it's the one thing, you know, like a lot of civilians don't get like the military, right? Like the commerce library, like the close friends you stay. Like I'm still friends with people I work for, work with, you know, like most civilian jobs, you know, well, I got laid off and you never see them, you never talk to them again. People, I don't think you get the closeness that you have in the military. Yeah. It's a, it's a different shared experience. Right. And then frankly, you know, that was really, uh, that was a hard transition for me as I left the military to the civilian world, just because you go from this area where you go through a shared experience and not just kind of like a, yay, we made a lot of money shared experience. It's like, you know, we, we did some stuff, you know, and it really does bring a lot of you together. And even if you didn't share that experience directly with someone like you and I, can sit down and rip and riff on this for for a while. Like, serve together. Like, yeah. I mean, yeah. And it, and it goes it goes generationally. You know, you know, my my father served in Vietnam. My father in law served in Vietnam. I have a great uncle who was in Korea. Grandfather World War Two. You know, you just sit around and you know, you just know that that's there. And you also, I think, I also think I also empathize a little bit with them civilians or people who've never served before, I think they don't quite know the etiquette or have that sense of like what to ask, when to ask, how to ask it. And that's hard. And I think that's something that we as vets maybe need to help them out with a little bit better. I know one challenge I had when I first got the military, like, so when I got out, I was like, man, I don't want to be the typical eight, eight, you know, a person, you know, go, go, go. Like I would try to, you know, calm down. And still like, I, I thought I was calming down, not doing that much. <laughs> and the boss told me, well, Jason, you do so much. Like, I'm like at 30% capacity right now. <laughs> I'm day on, day off. Like, I don't know what I'm getting right now, right? And that was, for me, that's hard channel right there. Like, go, like, the common way, way down, right? Yeah. I feel like, go, 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 checklist. Got to get it done now. You know, people counting you and that just, yeah. Yeah, I, I, it's funny you mentioned that because um, for a while there, people were like, can you chill out? I was like, what do you mean chill out? I'm fine. You guys just need to pick it up. <laughs> so, so um there, there's, there's some of that. I, I will definitely say I think I've mellowed a lot now. Yeah. <laughs> so how do you say being a military veteran has been a, a two-part question? How has being a military veteran been an advantage as an entrepreneur and a disadvantage to being an entrepreneur? I think the advantage is what we just talked about. Like I know that um, because I served and how I served, that it presents me opportunities to connect with individuals like yourself and like, the bunker labs community. Um, I know that. So I, and I know that. And I also know from an entrepreneurship perspective that, you know, I will be faced with challenges, but it's, is it really as bad as the challenges I faced, you know, in the sandstorm in Baghdad, which by the way, those are real and they're quite um, apocalyptic to be in. <laughs> um, so I think it provides that, uh, that perspective. I think on on the flip side, uh, the disadvantages is I think you have to realize as an entrepreneur that, you know, military, it, it gets drilled into you. Everything's dress, right, dress. There's a plan, there's an outcome, there's a mission, all this stuff. I think, I think a lot of that transfers over to business, but I think what doesn't and maybe shouldn't, frankly, is, is just how organized you are. I know that may sound weird, but I, I, I exactly what you're saying. Because you don't want to be too locked in to what you think is going to be the desired outcome or what you think the path is going to be because what you may find is that you're completely wrong. And if you fall into the trap of that old military thinking of, no, I, I set my target here. This is my target. This is my mission. You keep going that way, you're going you're gonna to find yourself broke. And I think, I think that's the nuance that you have to kind of find for yourself. Tap into that drive by all means. In the military, you really, really pivot in the military. Yeah. Much to its detriment, you know, sometimes. Yeah, and, I I, agree. And, and I think that, that's, the, that's the hardest thing because that, that drive and that courage and that perspective will help me make you very successful. But it also can be the trap if you're not careful because you may just be so locked in and have your blinders on to a way of thinking that you just completely go Bleh. Yeah, I think military does a great job of teaching people resiliency, right? Yep. Knock down 10, get up to 11, I mean, you need this entrepreneur, right? Yep. 
And one thing I'll push back with people too, like a lot of people like, you know, being an entrepreneur is hard, right? But I'll push back, well, is it, okay, I'll say it's not easy, difficult, but what I, I would say it's hard because we've done way harder stuff in the military, right? We've had to make decisions way harder. So is it hard to extend, but is it the hardest thing you've ever done? Probably not. And I'll, I'll tell people too, like, if being an entrepreneur is the hardest thing you've done in your life, you've had a blessed life. I mean, you've yeah. had a great life. If this is the hardest thing you do in your life, like, I mean, like, people have dealt with death, you know, bearing mothers, you know, you know, all this kind of stuff, you know, homelessness, you know, drug addiction, you know, losing loved ones and, you know, war. If this is the hardest thing you're doing, you, you got a pretty good life, I would say. Yeah, I, th I think, I, th I, I do think that's a concern. Um, I, I do think the military provides you with a perspective that I think it's really hard for those who never serve to understand as you talk about like the struggle, the resilience, you know, the factor there. I, I just think if you don't, there are others, but if you don't go through that, I think it's really hard. And I think it's hard for them to have that perception or that understanding. And I think another disadvantage of military people too, a lot of us are on a boat, right? Close your station in Fort Lewis, right? You'll probably very, very rarely lose Fort Lewis. You're, not, you're definitely not going to Seattle on a network events, right? So you don't, so you don't have this you know, network, right? And it's hard to build it up. You know, it's almost got to, you know, at, if, you, if you get out at 27, 30, retire 45, 50, it's like you, saw, you got to start, start all over again, right? You have no networks. You know, you don't know anyone with a team of commerce. You don't know anyone to start up again. And you got to start all over again because, you know, buffer, like, why? So, you know, military, you're working like five hour days. You, well, are you going to go network or business in two or three years? Are you going to like stay at home with your wife and kids and, you know, watch TV? I mean, yeah, it's, it's really hard. I mean, so my, um, I've heard it's better, a lot better now. And I, th I, think, uh, I think the military and the private sector deserve a lot of credit, I think, for coming a lot farther. But when I got out, you know, you, it was, you volunteer to go to a transition workshop. So I volunteered and the transition workshop was two four hour classes that were facilitated where they handed you a printout manual and where you spent the first day filling out bubble sheets about what you think your interests are and where you want to go. And the second day was a seminar, which I remember specifically, the feedback on the seminar was really, here's how you fill out a resume now, using the information that you just fill out the bubble sheet. Go out and take this week's paycheck and buy a nice pair of pants. Then take the next paycheck and go out and buy a nice jacket and go. And I... <laughs> And, you know, um, I floundered for a while. It, it, took, it took a while to figure out, like, how to just find a job and go after that. But then from what I hear now, well, what I see with the veteran community around here is I do see a lot of them, especially retiring ones, getting an opportunity to connect with communities up here in Seattle. So Fort Lewis is about, what, is about an hour and a half drive from here. Yeah, traffic. Hours, yeah. yeah, I mean, which is a trek if you've put in, like to your point, a twelve-hour day. But what, it, but what I've heard is that from a lot of them is that the military is providing a lot more space for them to actually do that. So they're cutting back. Yeah, our retirement is, is a lot better. But two stories I have. So how far they need to go? So from retirement twenty fifteen is two stories. I was in some kind of like get out army class, whatever. And there's a O six or a colonel O six or something major, right? Mm -hmm. And the most said. I wish I'd have known how important this was. I would let my soldiers actually do this. And see, the thing is, they don't know. Like, they're not, they're not, they're not teaching. Maybe I hope they are now, but I think, I think if you are a career officer, especially if you've gone through like the academies, you are so far removed from like the realities of what it yeah. takes to be a day to day US citizen just making a go and, as a professional. And, you know, most of those cats too they have a network that's really good and established yeah. where they can land at really well employers uh, that are established. It's, they just don't have, and another thing yeah. Too, too, most of the, the command, the commander's program, then I read on it, right? I have not, I've never seen a USR or, or like any kind of test of commander that says, what percentage of people getting out got jobs, right? It's, there's no incentive for them to even care, you know? Yeah, well, yeah, that's right. Because I mean, my assumption is their incentive is uh, how many do you actually keep on, on the re-up, yeah. which, which is, we need that, you know, I think, but I do think it's a challenge that we, 
we have to help them overcome. And that's why I think it's good that organizations like Microsoft, like Amazon, I know that they do send recruiters down to Fort Lewis. And I know that they've tried to set up programs, but I think, but I hope that anybody who's listening out there, especially those who are small businesses know that there are a lot of highly motivated, talented people who are leaving the service every day, every month, who would love to come work with you, for you, and they will get it done. And then there's the military spouses too. Who people yep. realize military spouses have like the highest unemployment rate. Most military spouses are like college degrees that can't do the job because they're moving every two years. Yep. And I think that's, I think it's just a cultural challenge, right? Like you have a force that is what, barely 1% of the U.S. population has served out of, we're now 340 million strong country. You know, 1% is not a lot. And yet, you know, it's the old, uh, it's the old argument. Well, we, we gave, we cut a blank check to the government with our life for you to enjoy all these things. Could you maybe just throw us a little bit more of a bone as we get out? Yeah, they have a lot of work to do. And one thing like the pet peeve of mine, like you have these companies, like we're gonna hire, you know, X amount of people veterans in ten years, five years. They never oh I'll give Starbucks did it, right? Starbucks came back and say we didn't miss our goal, we're gonna do a group. But most companies like we're gonna hire X amount in five years. They never come back and say if they did it or not. Well, that's that's a great call out because I think that's something where the veteran community, frankly, has an opportunity to maybe partner with um the Black Lives Matter community and a lot of these other communities out there where, you know, companies aren't actively showing their progress in these areas because they're afraid because then they'll get called out to the rug. But I'm going to do it as good brand marketing. Yep. Not doing it is not good brand marketing. Yeah. Talk the talk, walk the walk, right? Like, you're, like we were talking about. So um, I think Intel does it. Uh, but I don't, I, you know, there's, there's not a lot of companies out there who will publicly say and proclaim, yep, here's, here's what our goal was, here's where we're at, here's how we're changing it. And I, I do believe that with the movements that have been going on, that's going to change because I do believe that shoppers now, consumers, are going to be much more aware to the social accountability of a business. And I think that a big part of that is how do they treat their employees, how diverse is their employee base, and what do they do for the community? Do, exactly. Kind of stuff, yeah. yeah. So I'll change the subject again. So back to the, the, the marketing associate, especially with. Sure. What advice? So 20, 20, December 2019, you know, you're a college senior. You about to graduate six months. You got a couple, couple job offers. Mm-hmm. Family come visit you. COVID hits, the whole world changes. Mm-hmm. Now everything's up in the air. What advice do you have for them? Like to find a marketing job or they just like, you know, like deal with all this? Uh, one, take a breath. This, this is a challenge that you're facing in your life and it won't be the last one. Um, two, um, realize that, okay, you, you maybe had a dream and an idea and a path of where you were going to go. Okay, great. You may, the route to that dream and that path may have to change. So see how you can change to it. But three, realize that this could be, and probably is the golden age of marketing because every business a couple months ago was forced to shut down in the US. All of these retailers who were kind of dragging their feet towards becoming much more online retailers are now having to go that way. Every, a great opportunity. It's a huge opportunity. You know, we talked about the channels of expertise. If you've spent your whole life nerding out on a social media channel, great. Package it up and go sell yourself with that. You know, show how you can um, use that as an asset to a business. Um, you know, influencer marketing is it's going to continue to be huge. You know, people who people who are brand ambassadors who get a lot of views. Maybe you're connected to someone who's like that. Maybe that's what you want to be. You know, it's it's there are all these jobs that are being created right now out of thin air. So don't try and pigeonhole yourself. Be be flexible. Be ho- do different things. Yeah, be hopeful and just and just try try the best that you can to have a great attitude about it and just believe believe in yourself. So let's take another step. Like, so suppose someone's like a freshman, sophomore, junior in college. Yep. Regardless of the degree, like business, philosophy, whatever the degree is going to be, 
what skills would you say to sort of focus on on getting before they go to the job market? I think I think data analysis or the ability to understand and interpret data in a non-biased way is huge. Because all of these organizations that we're talking about, they're going to be looking at those sales and retention metrics through that. You know, and they're going to be running these experiments that are going to be done online or through digital media channels that that's just going to be data analysis. So I think if you can get really good at that, it doesn't necessarily mean math. Yes, math's important, but I mean, just understanding how data works, understanding how to present um, an unbiased view of the data so you can spot the trends and run experiments against it is going to be huge. I think the other thing is, um, you know, when I was starting out professionally, Microsoft Office skills were desired. Like, how, how good were you at Word? How good were you at Excel? How good were you at PowerPoint? No one cares anymore. Now it's, now it's um, how good are you at HTML5? You know, how good are you at um, the CSS? You know, so you, you may need to invest or think about investing in just picking up basic a basic coding, coding skill. Just, just something. It's, yeah, it's, it's the new currency. Data and, and coding and understanding it is the new currency. Now, nowadays, if you put like Microsoft Word in your resume, you get laughed at. Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah. I, I, I think that there's. I think businesses also are going to be very attuned to hiring people who are specialized in software products that they've just decided. Nope this is our product that we're going to use to do this thing for. So whether that's a Marketo, a Salesforce, a Pardot, um, you know, like a, a Pendo or something like that. So what are some marketing tools out there people could use? I mean, there's a lot of them out there. There's a lot. I think it really depends upon the stage your business is at. It really does. And the problem that you want it to solve. I think you have to be careful to make sure that you're not, you don't want to buy a Cadillac when all you need is a scooter. If you have five people coming, you probably don't need Salesforce, right? No, no, you don't. No. And see, that's a really good point. It's like, un understand the problem you're trying to solve. Just accept where you're at with your business because the worst, I've seen it happen before, where they, uh, a software product was overbought, just, just didn't need it, and so much time and energy and resources were wasted onboarding it, like hundreds of thousands of dollars which depending upon the size of your business can be really impactful. I mean, and it makes your life worse. So you can't have the solution become the problem just to solve the problem. That's a mistake I've made in the past as a customer. I, I tell people not to make. In the past, I've made the mistake of like buying, we'll say a sales platform, but I don't need it for another six months, right? Or I don't need yep. this for another six months, right? Well, there's this big deal going on right now, so I'll buy it now. And I waste six months of money, right? I've, I've done that too many times, right? So I'll definitely tell people, don't buy until you absolutely need it, you know. If you think you need it, wait a month, you know, and try to figure something else out. Yeah, and I, I would just say, um, g give yourself some grace, too, when you make a mistake. We're all in the business of making mistakes <laughs> and, and then learning from them and get better. So, Adam, besides yourself, who are some, like, marketers or, like, customer design service people that people should be following on social media or just as influencers? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, well, follow me first. Uh, but after that, I actually always coach people to do this. Think of a brand that you just love. Why do you love them? Like, why? Think about the last place that you went to where you just had an incredible experience. Like, you were like, wow, this was the best. And it could come from anywhere. Like, I'll share this story. So, like, my family and I, pre COVID, we were down in uh, the Oregon coast. Uh, family reunion. And we finally got away from the family and my family went to the beach and my son found um, an injured bird on the beach. And he absolutely would not let us leave until we, we were going to save this bird. And so prior to going to that beach, we had asked my brother-in-law, hey, there's this little aquarium near the beach. Is it worth going to? He's like, nah, the junk, don't, don't go there. So like, okay, we won't go there. So we're going to like, well, what are we going to do with this bird? Kids can have a heart attack if we leave this poor bird here to die. So we finally said, okay, what if, honey, you go down and just go talk to that aquarium and see if they can help out? 
So she's like, okay. So she goes to the aquarium. She comes back. She's like, they'll, they'll actually take him. So what it turns out is that aquarium had a partnership with uh, a local wildlife rescue fund that all you have to do is you have to just tell them where the animal is and they'll either come out or you can bring the animal to this aquarium and they'll help it out. So we brought the animals to the aquarium and they were like, oh yeah, no big deal, everything like that. And we're just like, wow, what a great experience. We'll take four tickets right now. Oh, and we'll spend $40 to go feed the harbor seals that you have over here too. And it was this very, very- it's Simple for them to do. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, not, not hard to do, just- yeah. And, and that's, so that's the thing that when, when people ask me like influencers to follow us, it's like, actually just b- take a step back and be aware, you know, like again, pre COVID, like uh, the YMCA that I go work out at, they had, all their staff went around and just wrote like, thank you for being a Y member on the mirrors. Is it, is it that hard? Is it, is no, it's not. And so just seek, seek your inspiration from things like that. You'll, you'll probably find it within your your local community from some local small business that's out there just scrapping right now and who really loves what they do and they love the value that they're trying to bring to the marketplace and they're trying to find unique and creative ways. You know, I think like, um, you like cupcakes? Oh, yeah. yes. Cupcake Royale? Yeah, yeah. You see what she's been doing? Yeah. She was great. She was so creative. So Cupcake Royale, to your listeners, is like a little Seattle like boutique cupcake shop. She makes it like the best cupcake. She's kind of grown. I think they've got like six locations now around Seattle, Puget Sound area. But like COVID, she had to close, but then immediately she was on it. She was, she was one of the early ones to say, hey, well, you can come pick up. Hey, we've taken care of our employees. Hey, here's some fun things here. They just, they figured out how to pivot. They figured out how to make it. They figured out how to find their voice, how to acknowledge it, how to make people feel safe. And just how to delight people still. Yeah, I like to be able to do like customer, customer delight. Yeah. Customer, yeah. The customer delight officer. Yes. Yeah. You know, and, and there's, there's a place for that at all levels of business. So, you know, when I, when people say follow, I, I'd say, um, just imagine you're kind of, well, you can't really walk around now. Walk around, wear your mask, six feet apart, please. But just, just be digitally aware. You know, watch, watch how the brands are interacting with you. Think about the brands that you've interacted with. Think about the businesses where you've been, wow, that was so cool how they did that. Look for the businesses that say congratulations to one of their customers in the social media channels. Like, great job. You know, you just, you just surpassed your 1,000th customer. Woohoo! you know. Look for businesses like that. Yeah, follow, yeah, follow that yeah, stuff. Right. Think about it's pretty simply easy to do, but so many companies don't do it. They don't, and I think they just it's it's do you think it's gonna soak in the grind with a you know nose of the grindstone, you know, the what's the word saying they're they're in the they can't see the forest of the trees, just grinding, and grinding, and grinding, and they I think there's some of that. I think there's some of that. I think there's also maybe some times of analysis paralysis. You know, I think there's there's also typically a tension between um uh, you know, we were te- we were making fun and harping on like the poor experience of coming out as the COVID heroes and the Black Lives Matter heroes after you never heard from them in a while. So I think businesses are f- also sometimes afraid to take that step. And again, it just it doesn't have to be rocket science. It's like say thank you to your customers. You know, teach them how to use your product. Listen to them. Oh, that's a tip. Yeah, you'll buy something like there'll be no manual in the box. Yep. You, there's like an email you send, no answer. Like, yep. Don't over-engineer it. Just start simple. And just remember, that just do one to others, right? You know, how would you like to be true? So, so yeah, there's a lot of good thought leaders out there, but I would just say, start, start by thinking for yourself. And again, just, it's not even being bold and being courageous. Just start by saying, thank you. Start by saying, I want to make sure that you understand exactly how to use this. Do you have any questions? Be proactive. Don't wait. Yes. So Adam, can you share your social media so people can reach out to you or you and your, you and your company? Yeah, the easiest way to find me is you could just go to, um, you can go to csbydesign.com. That's the website. That's where you'll find all the uh, recordings, learning centers, and you can find a contact form to get in contact with me. Uh, on LinkedIn, it's, uh, the company is Customer Success by Design. It's on Facebook as well too and Twitter. And for our listeners, we'll have the links to his social media on our show notes. You can find our show notes at www.cavendishtallblog.com. And be sure to share this episode with your friends and your network. 
So Adam, we couldn't even talk. So any uh, last minute advice or wisdom or anything you want to talk about? Uh, just uh, keep the faith. You know, everybody's out there. Stay true to yourself. Stay true to your customers. Pivot and uh, make it happen. Adam, thank you very much for being here today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks so much, Jamie. I had a great fun. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.